Um, thank you for people, um, to people who are joining us. Um, I know it's just turned 12, but um, we'll let some more people shuffle in. Um, I guess we'll just start off. Um, it's such an honor to have you with us. Um, this is the first event of, of the year. Um, we go till Sunday. And to everyone joining, um, thank you so much for being here. I really encourage you to go to all the other events that we're offering. Um, we have another Zoom today at four with a couple of amazing screenwriters. We also have um, a, a screening of the advanced screening of the film Renfield tonight at seven. Um, so all these events you can find on our Instagram, um, on our website. So make sure to check them out. Um, and we're we're going till next Sunday. So we have a whole a whole plethora of a bunch of amazing, um, both virtual and in person, um, stuff that we're putting on. Uh, but let's get to why we're here um, today. Um, it's such a great pleasure to introduce Tessa Moshveg again to the first ever event of this year. Um, she is a critically acclaimed novelist known for books such as Laf Lova, My Year of Rest and Relaxation, and Eileen, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 2016. Um, an adaptation of her film, Eileen, uh, which she co-wrote and produced the screenplay for, stars Anne Hathaway and Thomas and McKenzie. Um, it premiered at Sundance in Jan January to rave reviews. Um, another novel of hers, My Re Year of Rest and Realization, is also currently in the works with her returning as a screenwriter. And finally, she also produced and co-wrote the screenplay for Causeway, a film that I really love um, about um, a U.S. soldier suffering from a traumatic brain in injury who finds an unlikely friendship upon her return home. Um, it was released in 2022 to amazing reviews. It stars Jennifer Lawrence and Brian Tyree Henry. Um, and yeah, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's such an honor to have Otessa with us today. Um, and many of my friends here at Brown and I were so excited that you're joining us. Um, you know, I'm so eager to hear about your creative process, your current projects, um, you know, and any advice, uh, particularly any advice you have for students here. Uh, but before we get to that, um, it would be remiss not to mention that you're a grad student here. Uh, so that's kind of where I just want to start. Um, I'd love to hear about your time here on campus, um, you know, specifically things that you remember, um, and if there are any, you know, classes or teachers or people who you met here at your Brown experience that, um, you know, were particularly impactful or help inform your career now. Hmm. <clears throat> well. Hi everybody. Um, I I have to say that my I I was only at Brown for two years. Okay, and um, as a grad student, I tried to spend as little time on campus as I possibly could. Um, I lived sort of like a drive away, um, and and so whenever I would have to come to school. I had to deal with parking. And I remember a lot of like looking for parking space. Um, That's a common theme to, to people. Yeah. And then, you know, wanting to keep it. Um, so I would sort of like plan to do everything that I had to do um, and then do it and then leave. So I didn't have a lot of hanging out time which is kind of unfortunate and probably really different for undergrads, right? Um, but I spent a lot of time in the computer, the, the computer lab um, at the library. I guess it was on the second floor. I don't know if it's still there. Um, I which think library do you remember? The, the big one. <laughs> This, oh, the Sili or the Rock? There are a lot of different. Weird... The Rock, I think. Yeah, yeah. This is how bad. This is <laughs> this is how absent I was. I don't even. I'm just guessing. Um, I think because I didn't have a printer, I had to go and like print everything before I handed it in. Um, but I got really into using the universe university system like online database for um old periodicals mm. looking through 
like the, you know, the Nexus, Lexus, whatever. Um, and that's how I stumbled on an article that inspired my very first book, which was, you know, a godsend. I wasn't even really looking to write a book. I was just curious about what was happening in 1850 in Salem, Massachusetts, um, and looking through an old newspaper and found an, you know, an article that was this big that inspired an entire project and is now a book. Well, it's a novella. And I'm trying to get the film made. Um, but it's a film that is about it's a period film that is about um, a very uh, sexy and very messed up alcoholic uh, closeted homosexual. And um, he commits a murder at the beginning of the movie and then we find out that the guy that he's killed is actually like his best friend and they were secretly in love. Um, to me, that sounds like a movie I'd want to watch, mm -hmm. but it is very hard <laughs> to find financing for something like that. Um, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was that that was kind of the big thing for me at Brown was writing that. And that book was called McGlue, which was the name, the name of the protagonist. Um, there were a lot of people who kind of inspired me. I think, you know, what was really cool is I get I I, I took the last class that Robert Coover offered. Um, in, I can't remember the name. It was something like ancient narrative texts. Um, it, was a, it, it was a pretty small class and we read things that I never would have read ever. Um, but the big thing about that was, you know, I had, I had been a creative writing concentration in college. I had just spent like a year already in graduate school in fiction nobody had ever talked about plot ever ever and and Coover's class was the first time I was like oh maybe plot isn't this cheap thing for tv maybe it could be applied in my writing in a way that feels you know artful um so was your education beforehand very experimental in terms of the writing you were exposed to? Yeah, I mean, that's also the writing that I sought out, you know? Um, and that's been a big shift since like my teens and 20s to I'm almost 42 now, you know? Like the last 10 years, let's say, I've been more interested in, um, telling stories that can be understood, you know, conveying, conveying narrative experiences with characters that the reader or the audience doesn't have to like, feel like they're being brain damaged. But at the beginning, I wanted that, you know, the beginning of my writing was like, writing is the sacred act. I still think it is, but, um, it, you should never demand of your writing that it should make sense, you know? It should be this like standalone like uh, piece of music. Like you don't go around explaining why a piece of music works, you know? Um, and I think that was important for me because what I did with that philosophy was like really work on my style and my tone. Um, you know, like the poetics of language, how to be, how to evoke a world and look at the things in the world and how naming them can build an atmosphere, things like that. Um, I'm really interested to hear about um, 
also in, in regards to Brown, I heard that you taught undergraduates here. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, piggybacking off what you just said, kind of what did you teach them? Was that you know, more experimental and what did you think of you know, that, that experience? Um, what did I think? I mean, I think, I felt like I was undertaking like an enormous responsibility as leading a writing workshop. <clears throat> and um, I still know two of my students from that workshop, um, which is really awesome. One of them just published a book and it's fantastic. Um, and got like really good reviews and I'm so proud of her. Not like I take any credit, but um, you know, I'm happy that I, I, I met her at the beginning. Um, you know, students at Brown were, they seemed really open and like kind of doing each their own thing. And I totally respected that. Um, and I think what I tried to do was take every, every um, conversation to be, um, you know, a different way of considering uh, the, the project. Like the, each project required its own unique paradigm. So, you know, some people were working on things that felt like confessional memoir narrative, for example. And so, you know, we would talk about the voice and like what was being said and how. And other people were writing totally different things, like, you know, a sci-fi story. And so that we would, you know, throw away the, the old rules and sort of like look at what are the rules of this um, or not talk about rules at all. Which, which, which is a really, which is a really boring way of saying the people were really interesting, students were really interesting, and they were kind of, um, I don't really know how much they <laughs> needed me or if I helped them at all, but uh, it was, it was fun. It was really fun. I taught, I taught, uh, yeah, two semesters. And um, I have not taught since then. Would you ever want to return to teaching in any shape or form or no? Maybe, maybe. It's so, I think teaching is such a huge thing to do. And um, my parents were both teachers. They're both classical musicians. And so like they, they focused on their careers as educators rather than their careers as performers, let's say. And I, I feel deeply that I'm in like my performer uh, era mm -hmm. right now. Um, and there's just, there are a lot of other things I would wanna do before teaching. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, now, speaking of your performing era, um, I just love to now kind of move the conversation towards your writing, specifically your writing process. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested to hear about kind of what is a typical day of writing, what it looks like for you, you know, where you are, um, how, how you enter a day of writing. Uh, well, no, it really depends on what I'm writing. When I'm when I'm like doing a first draft of a novel, it looks like me sitting down for 15 minutes at a time and like taking my computer to different places in my house to see if it works better. <laughs> I don't, I am not the kind of person to just be like, you know, I am very, I get really overwhelmed. I don't 
trust myself to not go crazy in that moment. So I'm like, oh, better take the dogs for a walk or better do the dishes. So sometimes it looks like that. And I think that's because a first draft is like such a, re requires such specific energy. And for me, it is, I mean, part of the thrill of it is that it's like something I'm always chasing and it's always kind of right around the corner. Um, and if it escapes, then I'm like, well, I have to wait for it to come back. Um, when I'm revising a novel, I am like a machine. Um, I, it, I, I know that I'm using the same brain that wrote the book, but it feels brand new. Um, and that's because once you've reached the end of an enormous project, you have so much more perspective than when you, than you began, right? So you have essentially taken this like master class in the book, and now you know what the book shouldn't be. That's sort of where you start, um, well, where I start. And so I love the, I love revising. For every novel I write, I probably do like 20 revisions, at least um, going through the book chain. You know, I like, I like printing things and editing on paper. Um, and it turns into this like enormous collage because I'll cut pieces and tape them and then write in. Um, I like the hands-on process of that. And, um, you know, that's work that I do alone. In screenwriting, I've written some things alone, um, but more and more I'm collaborating, co-writing screenplays. And the process is very, very different than in a novel for me because each novel has its own process, and I and it seems that um, writing follows. Uh, there, there are some necessary steps, right? Mm -hmm. Like developing the idea, knowing who your characters are, what the movie is. You know, like what kind of movie is this? Is this like a Hollywood comedy? You know, like, are we going for like fast and easy? Um, is this like a weird, edgy, spiky, you know, indie movie? What's the style? What's the tone? Who are some directors that would capture this in the way that we're imagining? So, and when you're working with someone else, it, takes a lot of talking to communicate, you know, because first you're communicating and you're like, well, it could be this, right? And then you're communicating and you're like, oh yeah, what if it is that? And then you have to make sure that that, that in, in your head is the same thing in your collaborator's head or else you're gonna have a totally useless conversation. But, um, what I've found that is that sometimes, and I'm going to contradict myself, but sometimes if you don't understand each other, if your collaborator says something and you're like, what? Oh, no. Like, that's totally not what I was imagining. You know, and you feel free to say that. But I, for me, sometimes I'm, I'm like, oh, Oh, you know, it can, I can kind of allow it to widen my own idea. Um, so there's does, a lot of that. And, and does, you know, for me specifically, uh, writing by myself comes a lot easier um, just because, you know, collaboration can bring, um, you know, difficulties in terms of, you know, disagreements and such. Does one come easier to you? Um, you know, were you initially, um, you know, as you entered the business, drawn to one or the other, or um, what are your thoughts on kind of those differences? I think that um, right now, the projects that I'm being drawn to are collaborative. And part partly it's because the, um, 
the genesis of the ideas has been collaborative. Like uh, I'm, I'm co-writing a screenplay right now. And by the way, my co-writer is also my, my life partner and husband. So like we just wake up and go to the living room and start working. <laughs> um, but we, the, the projects that we're working on right now are projects that we developed for a long time with producers and, and or our director. So there's been, it's like, it's not so much a screenplay about my authorship, you know? It's really about using everything that has been conjured, using the skills and like, yeah, some of what makes me me, um, but toward a common goal rather than like my own interior vision. And um, that is a good exercise. Like I've taught myself and my collaborators have taught me a lot about how to find the most interesting approach, how to push a story into its most unexpected moment, its most tense moment, um, which is something that I didn't think about as a novelist. You know, for fiction, I'm so much more interested in um, the music of the story, you know, the storytelling delivery um, rather than the dramatic setup. Um, and I think that screenwriting has changed my fiction writing a lot. I mean, just in the, I don't know if any of you guys have, uh, or gals or you, um, have read my last book, but it's like in a very different register than, let's say, Eileen, right? Um, although Eileen is also a, a book, okay, it is a movie, but it, it, it is a book that was influenced by cinema, but not in its, um, not in its structure, rather in its sort of aesthetic approach. That, that's interesting you say that. I mean, I'm thinking of Causeway specifically, and um, as you talked about, you know, the setup for this dramatic moment, uh, for those of you who've seen it, who are watching that scene um, by the pool um, towards the end, um, you know, when, when they have that, you know, very obviously dramatic fight, um, obviously there was that setup, but it did feel really well-intentioned and, and you weren't surprised by it as well because of everything that happened before. Um, now, I'd love to, you know, ask you about, you know, kind of talking more about this difference between screenwriting and uh, novel writing. Um, I was reading an interview you did in 2016 for The Guardian. Um, and again, if, if this is a comment, I know like people ask a lot of questions and if this answer, you know, you don't remember anything, uh, but you were asked, uh, might you write the screenplay yourself to which you said, no way. Um, I'm wondering if anything changed in, the, in that mentality. Yeah, a lot, a lot. I mean, when I was asked that question, I had never written a screenplay. I had had no, I had a no real knowledge of how film, the film industry works. And um, I also felt that writing a movie adaptation of my novel would be kind of like self-exploitative. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the first, the first film project that came to me was an adaptation of McGlue, which was a, such an awesome way for me to start because it didn't feel cheap and phony and like I was trying to turn something that felt like art, art into entertainment. I was working with people who were like, do whatever you want, um, which, which was a beautiful way to approach learning how to write in a new form. Um, so the Eileen screenplay, you know, it didn't happen right away. And that's because, uh, producer optioned the, um, rights to the novel. Somebody else wrote a screenplay that I've never read. The movie didn't get made. Mm -hmm. And then the producer let the option go. 
So I got it back. And um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do with it until I met I had like, you know, like we all did on um, Zoom during the pandemic, a meeting with a director that I really liked named William Oldroyd, who had made a movie called Lady Macbeth a couple of years earlier. And we were actually talking about a book that I had just published called Death in Her Hands. And I was, you know, taking meetings like with people who might want to option that book. And he said, well, you know, the movie I really want to make is Eileen. And I really liked Will. And we talked about what the movie would be like. And it just seemed like a really obvious um, kismet. Mm. So um, Luke, my partner, and I just immediately started talking uh the three of us about the script with will and it happened kind of magically and easily in a way that i'm like i need to be making movies with these people for the rest of my life like there was there there was no like pulling out my hair or like trying to solve an impossible problem and yet it was really satisfying um the, I think having a director's vision really helped in getting the, getting the novelist me out of the way. Mm. Um, but the novelist me, the one who had weirdly written the book, but like didn't really remember writing the book, <laughs> um, I I was so proficient in the characters that I knew, you know, exactly what they would say, exactly what they looked like, how they walked and moved and what the house looked like and what the bathroom looked, you know, I knew that, I knew it. Um, and in some cases I knew it too well. And that working with Luke, you know, helped bring out the unexpected in the screenplay which I think was like the, the thing that I needed to, to kind of get beyond um, the movie as like a, like a, just a you know, repositioning of the book. The, the movie really is, it's more of a translation than it is anything else. And in translation, you have to be creative you know so i'm interested about oh sorry to interrupt um um i i was reading about um anne hathaway you know thomas and mckenzie thomas and mckenzie um they were talking about um again as you were talking about you knew this these characters back and forth you knew what the house looked like what the bathroom looked like etc cetera, etc cetera. um and, and your book in a way um at least from what i what i read um, helped you know your actors, those actors, um, and it, it informed their characters. Obviously, in addition to the screenplay, can you talk a bit about um, you know the role kind of your book may play in, in helping actors realize their parts? I mean, I guess it's good backup material. You know, mm, there's something about you know, I guess. Eileen is written in the first person point of view. So for Thomas and Mackenzie, who really took on the role just amazingly well, kind of like it, no one else could have done it. Um, she, she said that she had been reading the book and like really kind of trying to analyze um, the character psychologically as a way to get into her. And so I suppose that the first person narrative helped, you know, because she, when you read the screenplay, you know, you know what Eileen does and you know, you know, what things seem like because it's a visual form, you know what she says, but when you read the novel, you also know what she's thinking. And um, 
I think that that is, you know, kind of an un, unexpected bonus for an actor. I could also imagine that it could be detrimental. Um, and I'm just glad it wasn't. <laughs> um, now I'm also interested to hear about, um, in addition to your role as screenplay, re screenwriter for you know, these adaptations that you undertake with directors, can you talk a bit about your role um, as a producer and your role kind of beyond, beyond the writing? Sure, I mean, producing is something that I didn't really know I would ever be interested in. Um, but I've found that the more projects I'm involved in, there, I see that there are ones that I kind of want more control over for as long as I can have that control. And I didn't really know what producing was until I started doing it. And that it's basically the, the role that I have had as a producer is develop, in development, um, developing projects. And, um, you know, if, if you put me on a lot, I would have no idea how to produce, you know, I'm not a line producer, but um, it seems like something that you can learn by doing. Um, and the more I'm around Hollywood, actually Hollywood isn't really a good term. It's really the industry, but Hollywood is kind of a piece of the industry because well, all the executives are here kind of um, in the US and all the agencies are here. And that's all been weirdly important um, <clears throat> because a producer does need to understand how to um, like orchestrate timing and when to ask questions of certain people and when to push this and when to ask for money, you know? Um, and that's been, I mean, that that's just totally trial by fire. I, and also I just depend on a lot of people to tell me what, what's going on all the time. And, and you talked about obviously your role uh, as producers, mostly in development, uh, do you often visit the sets of, you know, for example, Eileen or, or Causeway, or do you kind of take a step back from those things? I was not on, we did a set visit to Causeway, but um, it was more of a visit to meet with like everybody who was working on the set rather than be on set and we were not there when the they were shooting um and that project was very different because uh my partner and I were hired to come in to rewrite a movie that was an adaptation of a novella that we actually hadn't even read. <laughs> and after the, our version of the movie shot, well, actually it didn't. The, our, the shoot for our version of the movie was interrupted by a hurricane. Oh, wow. Okay. Then they couldn't schedule reshoots. In the meantime, they lost one of their producers. They re-envisioned the movie. They had someone else come in and do another rewrite. And then a pandemic happened. Everybody was busy. And it was like, I don't know how many years mm -hmm. later they shot the rest of the movie. So the movie that I saw, I'm like, oh, I wrote that scene. I did not oh, write that scene. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. but. Um, but I mean, I think the heart of the movie was always there. And it was that this was like a very spare portrait of somebody coming home after being 
like literally blown up. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was very quiet and it was very, you know, tense and also really an interior uh, experience. And what was cool about the work that we did was that like, we made the movie more about her experience with this guy who she, who, who she meets. And it, it is a very unlikely friendship in a way. Um, but, you know, they both sort of find themselves broken and needing to heal. Um, and then their chemistry is just really kind of just like fun to watch. Yeah, the, uh, sweet. the chemistry was, for lack of a better word, I watched it a couple of months ago with my family and there was this magical chemistry between uh, the, the two leads. Um, I am curious with Causeway, um, you know, I, I saw an interview where you talked about, you know, you actually had time to sit down with, with Jennifer Lawrence and go through the role and, you know, hear her thoughts, um, you, know, a, you know, as an actor and also as a producer for the film. Can you talk about that, that discussion you had with her? Well, it was really granular. We were, <clears throat> we were working on the script up until the last minute and the movie was getting cast. Jennifer Lawrence was always attached um, because it was kind of a project that she wanted to star in and produce. Um, so we had, you know, a, a read through and we got to, you know, really hear hear the movie um, and kind of fine tune it in ways and also see the way that the characters might interact on screen um, in real life. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very help. I think it must be a very helpful step for everyone. I mean, and the director is there obviously there, I don't remember if our producers were there. Um, I mean, it, I mean, it's really, really exciting. Also, Jennifer Lawrence is such a good actress. Like, I didn't actually appreciate how brilliant she is um, until I saw her not acting. You know, like in moving from non-acting to acting. And I, it was kind of my first experience with an actor, actually. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm com- like I'm kind of mystified by that whole art form. Uh, yeah, I remember watching it, and ten minutes, and I was like, "Wait, is that Jennifer Lawrence?" Just because mm-hmm. she did look like Jennifer Lawrence, clearly, but you know, she really, you know, I, I didn't see her as you know Katniss from Hunger Games or all these other roles she did. She really disappeared in, into that into mm-hmm. that role. Um, so I, I'd love to kind of take a step back, um, ask you some questions um, about kind of advice you have and, and other stuff um, in that realm. Uh, my first is, you know, you, you were talking, you mentioned at the beginning that your parents do come from a musical upbringing um, and, you know, are musicians themselves. And in turn, you come from a very musical upbringing. Um, I'm curious, you know, as someone who is a writer, a filmmaker, a producer, um, and you know, a, a musician, at least when you were a kid, um, do you think, you know, as, as an artist, you can really explore all art forms? Um, or do you think it's kind of better to almost pick a lane and only focus and put all your energy into that one form? Oh, I don't think it's either or. I mean, I think as a writer having studied music as seriously as I did as a kid, I I know that that helped form everything about the way that I approach writing. I mean, that was a fundamental building of sensitivity and skill, thinking about voice, thinking about melody, thinking about self-expression, thinking about genre, all of those things. I mean, and I think the more you get into a create a, a creative form that you love, even if it's not what you want to pursue, 
the more sophisticated your taste gets, the more sensitive your ear or your eye or whatever, all of those things are going to help you. I mean, I grew up with a mother who, you know, fully believed in a well-rounded art education. I mean, she also put me in like computer classes and maybe like a science class, but I took, you know, we went to the museum every week and you know, we were always going to plays. We were always going to concerts. The house was full of books. Um, I took art classes. I took dance classes, music theory classes, you know, violin lessons, piano lessons. I was in chorus, like all of those things contributed to how I thought basically like if, if writing was my calling, all of that contributed to an education for that. Um, and I would say that do my advice is to just expose yourself to as much as you possibly can following the breadcrumbs of your own curiosity. Because when you're in the middle of your career, <laughs> you're not going to have time for all of that. And that's like one thing that is, is hard is that when you're, you know, I've, I feel I'm at a point where I feel like I've worked so hard to get to a point where I'm this busy. Mm. And now that I'm this busy, I all I want to do is take a year off to learn how to sew and go back to painting and, you know, all of these other things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the more, the, the more that you can do, the more that you want to do, the more you should do. But, okay. but, but, I mean, that isn't to say that you shouldn't also be extremely disciplined and serious about the form that you're pursuing. Um, you need that, that needs to feel like your job. Right. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I think uh, the amazing thing about being at Brown or just college in general is that you are, especially at Brown with the open curriculum, you are exposed to so many different art forms and you're not, um, you, you're not stuck with one per se. Uh, but then, you know, so many students here do have such niches. So I think, again, um, thank you for having, having that answer. There definitely is a, there's a balance between, between both. Um, now, before we get to the questions from, uh, you know, people watching, uh, in terms of advice, again, um, I'd love to hear kind of what you learned about, um, you know, establishing your, yourself in the industry and, and pursuing a career in creative arts. Um, do you have advice to students who are kind of uh, on the edge, you know, deciding whether it's something they really want to commit to? Well, I can only tell you what worked for me, you know? And I think that if I, okay, I think the ground zero of it all is you need to really want mm -hmm. to be, to have your art be your career. Like there needs to be no other option <laughs> because it's so stressful to go out and take the risk. And it's so much pressure to put on your talent um, that it's very, very, very easy if you have an alternative to just be like, you know what, I think I'm going to keep this as my thing that I love doing and just have, have some stability and pursue the thing I know could be um, something to sustain my life, like literally. Um, so given that, um, you know, you, for myself, it helped that I had lived in New York for 10 years. Mm. It helped me because of several, several things, actually. I think the big one is I learned not to be too impressed by power. And I think that, you know, there's a way, there, there's an attitude toward 
the, the like the people in an industry that have the power to fund your movie or not, or mm -hmm. you know introduce you to this director or not, you know, and it, it's really it, it's really so much about you understanding understanding that everybody started not knowing what they're doing you know and if you act as though like everything is like this you know um incredible once in a lifetime thing you're going to seem like you don't know what you're doing and it, it's kind of like the, this uh we're all sort of playing along in this delusion that we know what we're doing. So you have to kind of just pretend that too, until you do know what you're doing. Right. And then you can just relax. Thank you. Um, now I'd love to go to um, audience questions. So if you're watching and you have any eager questions, please, please type them in. Uh, we definitely have time for a couple. Um, Natalie Mitchell, thank you for all your amazing questions. Um, one thing, uh, I, I'll choose this one. Uh, I'll read it out loud. Uh, this is something I've been wondering too. Um, so if you can give us any information, uh, how has it been working with Yorgos Lanthimos in my year of rest and realization? How has your artistic style and his sort of been enmeshed within the film? Um, and how much creative agency do you think you have on a visual level? Uh, so again, you can tackle any of those specific questions, but. Well, you know, there's definitely a difference between writing a script. Okay, I'll start this way. You could write a script on spec all alone in your room, not know who's going to produce it, who's going to direct it, who the DP is going to be, and who's going to star, anything like that, or what the budget is going to be. Um, and you can just dream up this movie the way that you see it. If there's a if there's an underlying IP like a novel, you have a sort you have source material now. You can study what's the approach, what's the vibe, who's this character, where's where is this going? You know, you now have you don't have a script but you have information and you have inspiration. So that's a different experience. Now, if you take that, now I have all this inspira inspiration from my source material and I have a producer and I have a director who's a very specific director. It's impossible now for you to just dream up whatever you were going to do. Now you have a movie like it's somewhere hanging in the balance of these things right um and it's your job to extrapolate the vision of the director your vision and the inspiration from the book and um i think it was really important for me you know i i wrote um and shared with your ghost lanthimos several drafts of the screenplay for contributing what I could to what I knew was going to be his vision of the movie. And um, it's sort of like, it's sort of like I had to study his, his filmmaking oeuvre to understand what approach he takes, you know, and how the story would be best told in his vision um, and then write accordingly. I mean, that sounds very boring, but um, the amount of, I see there's this question about agency. You know, the creative agency that you have is, you know, if you say uh, she's sitting by the window, it, it has to be, there has to be a reason, you know, because if that's just your idea and there's no reason, <laughs> they could very easily be like, oh, well, there's no window in the place we want to shoot this, so forget that, 
you know, like you, they're, they're, I think you end up having to justify your ideas and sort of like scrutinize them and be so certain of them that they can't go anywhere. Um, so it's, it's a different sort of approach. I don't know if that makes any sense, okay. but that, that's how I experienced it. Um, now on the same subject uh, with my year of rest and relaxation, um, another question we have um, is from, or it's from Anonymous, but it's why in, in your novel, my year of rest and relaxation, um, why decide to not give a name to the main character? Um, the, the person said, I've seen this done in some novels and films, and I'm wondering the purpose of employing this resource. You know, it's the only time I've not named a character in a novel, and it just seemed like in keeping with the, the protagonist's aversion to being tacky, it was kind of as though I was, I had to write under her super judgmental eye. And if I had tried to name her something, it, it was going to be the wrong name. Like I had tested it, you know, and each time I was like, oh, the moment I named her, she became less interesting. Um, she had less power over me. And I really wanted her to stay that way um, or else the novel would have fallen apart. And so much of the book is about someone who's trying to unbecome themselves, even as much as they're obsessed with who they are. Um, the name, when you name something, it becomes so real. And I wanted her to still feel as though she could be in this liminal realm of real or not real. Um, another question we have about Eileen, um, I think this will be our last question, but it's, I'm wondering what is your perspective on the trope of the suffering artist, um, especially in the context of writing Eileen? Since the experience definitely sounds challenging in the description in your 2018 New Yorker interview. Hmm. I don't remember what I told the New Yorker in 2018. Um, suffering artists. I mean, I honestly don't know anyone who doesn't suffer. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe it's just that artists are, well, it's hard to make a living as an artist. So yeah, we do suffer a little bit in that way, maybe more than say, if you were a doctor or um, something else. <laughs> I, didn't know there was a trope um, of that in the context of writing Eileen. But I guess, you know, it, maybe the question is, um, why did you write Eileen? And I wrote Eileen because I had really been a short story writer. That's how I kind of identified as a short story writer. And then um, I graduated from MFA at Brown and talked to a literary agent who told me, yeah, your stories are great, but no one's ever going to publish a book of them unless you have a novel out. Mm. And so I wrote Eileen. The first, you know, my impulse was I need a career. You know, like I, like if I, I just went through all this, this is what I want to do. Um, I could go back to write, writing short stories for the rest of my life, but let me just try to do this thing to give myself a chance, you know, um, at being a published author. And, and that's, that was the first um, impulse toward the book. Awesome. And then, and then that got me thinking more. 
Um, thank you so much. To, to finish off, um, I have a few rapid fire questions I like to call them. Okay. About 10 of them. Um, just to break the ice, I, I guess, a bit. Um, but yeah, thank you again so much. And I'll, I'll again, uh, if you don't have an answer, you can just say skip. Um, okay. They're, they're pretty easy. They're pretty easy questions. All right. First of all, favorite building on Brown's campus. I'd probably say the library. Oh, sorry. All right. Oh, you froze. Sorry. Okay. Um, first ever concert. Pearl Jam. 1995 wow. at yeah. the Boston Garden. No way. I, right. I, wait, I think it was 1995. It was like right after Kurt Cobain had died. No, oh, wow. And I was 13. 93? Sorry, my husband is correcting me now. <laughs> Oh, you're right. It was 93. Yeah, I was in middle school. Uh, I oh. thought I was, so I was like 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. I was, I was there. Um, 94, 94. 94, okay. Um, next, Star Wars or Star Trek? Neither. Probably Star Trek. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is one author that inspires you? Just anyone. Um, Ralph Ellison. What is your favorite foreign film or foreign film you would recommend to anyone? Gosh. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm going to say Border came out a couple of years ago. It's, I think it's out of um, Denmark. And it's by an Iranian director named Ali Abbasi. Um, Border. It's great. Um, next, I heard that you have four dogs. Uh, yeah. This is a very important debate that I ask a lot of people. Uh, do you let the dogs in or out of the bed? Oh, my God. I don't get in the bed unless the dogs are in the bed. That's the question. <laughs> I totally agree with that. Um, <laughs> Next, chat GBT, scary or exciting? Kind of just silly. Silly. I don't, I'm not quite sure it's exciting. I don't yeah. find it scary. Okay, interesting. I find it very scary. Mm. Uh, what's a song that gets stuck in your head? Mm. Black by Pearl Jam. <laughs> Um, next, what is, I heard that you love vintage clothing. Do you have a favorite piece of vintage clothing that you currently own? Um, I recently, I'm trying not to buy leather, but I recently got a brown, a vintage brown leather jacket that is from France from the eighties and is like the most beautiful creation ever and I still haven't worn it but um yes I covet that it was like an amazing find um next favorite place to eat um in Providence if you can remember if not that's totally fine oh there was uh there was a oh gosh was it Thai food I can't remember. It was like there's this Asian food restaurant. Is it called Hang Thai? No, it wasn't around Brown's campus. It was like all the way up. There was like a famous bakery across the street. Can't remember. I'll, I'll look into it. Thank you. Then. Okay. Um, and finally, to finish off. I think this is my personal favorite question. Uh, would you rather get tickets to the Beyonce or Taylor Swift concert this summer? Mm, I'm going to say Tay Swift. That's, a, that's an amazing answer. 
Um, all right, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, I, as, as well as so many people I've talked to about this interview are really big fans of your work. Um, so I so appreciate um, you spending time um, to chat. Uh, thank you for I having me. For experience. Yeah. Um, to anyone watching, please go to the IFF Instagram um, to, to see the more events we have, whether virtual or in person. Um, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dylan. Thank you. Bye, everybody.